So I'll start the discussion this morning by talking about um, two or three different subjects. And the last but not least is cybersecurity. And this is something that has become far more common for people to be concerned about. We're living in a world of pandemics and political polarizations, which causes a lot of changes to our world. And also, fortunately, it brings about an additional awareness for the need for asset protection in general. Well, what have you done? What have you done to manage your risks? What have you done to manage security risk, task risk, tax risk, uh, speculative risk, liquidity risk, currency risk, interest rate risk, political risk, commercial risk, inflation, concentration risk, idiosyncratic risk, risks that are unique to certain companies and not others, management risk, intergenerational and extra jurisdictional risks, all of which are important subjects that we're going to be talking on today. Over the course of the last several years, many of you have come to us and said, what's next? We've done the state freeze. We've set up trust, like you've said. Um, what else can we do to achieve better asset protection? And those questions are refreshing. Uh, I believe that uh, the um, Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, um, which is made up of some 36 member nations, uh, has recently done something to increase cybersecurity risk. And that is they've made, mentioned cybersecurity in the context of major catastrophes that affect the member nations. Uh, going a little bit further than that, I would also say, ironically, that the OECD um, has also created additional risk by influencing 130 countries, including their 36 member nations, to incorporate a minimum tax through their base erosion and profit sharing policy, which has resulted in a 15% minimum corporate tax for companies that have over 750 million euros in revenues, which of course affects these large companies. So the additional risk there is what about smaller companies? Mark my words, I've been wrong before, but I don't think I'm wrong this time. And that is the 15% tax is gonna affect everybody eventually. It's only a matter of time before the, the uh, all 130 countries are imposing minimum tax uh, on uh, uh, companies from all around the world. I'd say that one of the things that causes us to you know be able to take a step back and think about risk are high profile cases. Well, I think of uh, 2017, Toys R Us filed for bankruptcy due to financial risks associated with a leveraged buyout for about six billion dollars by Bain Capital. They attempted to liquidate 700 stores, and they ran into a real struggle trying to to do so from a liquidity point of view. The risks were real. They were real to investors, they were real to creditors. I'd also refer to the uh, Latin American crisis, also known as the tequila crisis back in 94, which illustrates the risk for holding assets, in various different currencies, which a lot of us do. Uh, countries were unable to pay back some of this debt due to sudden loss in the value of the peso, caused emerging markets to be radically affected. The United Nations under the Clinton administration ended up organizing a $50 billion bailout to the, bailout rather, to the International Monetary Fund. Um, so the things that we see and we, we should be learning from as a society, as an organization, as, as individuals, and one of the, the points is, is that it makes us realize that individuals and companies and other such entities are not immune. We're not immune from vulnerability to litigation. We're not immune to cyber attacks that could affect our company. We have people that say, oh, we have a firewall already. Well, that's not enough, I don't think. And I think that's one of the things you're gonna find out today. Um, let's have a look at the slide. And then before we do that, I wanna introduce our expert panel. Uh, the first person that I would like to introduce here would be Colonel Ram Dor. Uh, Ram is speaking to us all the way from Tel Aviv, Israel. Welcome, Ram. And you're muted. <laughs> uh, Hi, Ram. everyone. Uh, Ram's background is primarily with the Israeli Defense Forces. Uh, Ram was uh, the CISO, or Chief Information Security Officer for the IDF. Um, also has been involved in working with governments, uh, as well as large corporations internationally. Uh, Ram's many years of experience, I believe, will be clear to you when he starts talking. <laughs> also, I want to introduce David Lesperatz all the way from Poland. Hi, David. Hi, Todd. How are you doing? Good to see you as always. So a good friend of our firm and our group, part of our consortium. Uh, and David basically brings a wealth of knowledge and expertise about asset protection, dealing with everything from uh, citizenship risk to residency-based risk to tax risk 
uh, assisting families with intergenerational transfers of wealth. Um, I want to introduce John McLeod. Welcome to you, John. Uh, I, I guess that John is a recognized world leader in the areas of fiduciary uh, activity, as well as the work with trust companies, being a CEO of Alliance and being uh, heading up the RBC's trust companies internationally for many years, as well, as well as being a CEO of a group uh, out of Singapore, Geneva, Switzerland, and Barbados. And uh, this is a world-class group, ladies and gentlemen. These individuals here are here to help you to achieve things that otherwise may not be achievable. Also, I'd like to introduce Jordan Louis. Jordan has been very instrumental in helping ultra high net worth people in order to uh, achieve guarantees, in order to deal with the inevitable, in order to assist them in, in putting together a plan that provides uh, not only funding for capital gains taxes, but also a plan to gain benefits and state equalization and many other very important things you'll hear from him. Um, without further ado, I'd like to jump right into this and have a little bit of tax fun. Uh, first, I'd like to uh, call on John McLeod. Now, John, um, I'd like you to kick this off, and I want to ask you a question, but before I do, I want to uh, put up a diagram so everybody can see it. I want to base the question on the diagram. Next slide, before we pose this question to John. <clears throat> All right, so here's a case study that we put together. I've asked a group for clients that are interesting, and this one I thought was fascinating and pretty common. We have an individual, Mr. Diamond. Mr. Diamond has three different verticals, multi-residential real estate, healthcare, green energy. He's got assets in five different continents. And basically we have all sorts of problems there. The eldest son is married, he lives in the UK, and he runs the business in UK as well as that, the underlying group in United Nations, sorry, UAE. <laughs> Uh, youngest son, well, he runs an agricultural company in Mexico, as well as a medical laboratory in Colombia. And basically, this is a hands-on group, a very successful family, and lots of risks. Interesting thing about Mr. Diamond, he likes to enjoy himself too. Where he finds the time, I don't know, but he does. He has a yacht and he has a private jet. And both of those things bring the family together uh, on an easier, more convenient basis than, than otherwise. And it's a great lifestyle and a fantastic client and we're really proud to uh, be able to be here today to be able to show you how we can benefit i'm going to say in the u.s there's a bunch of different issues going on we got llc's held by a canadian company which by the way you're going to hear about whether that's good or bad we see that all the time we have cryptocurrency companies we have also companies in different sectors and we have commingling of companies anyway let's jump into the issue with john and john i would like in the context of what we're talking about I'd like you to shed some light on the kinds of risks that face wealthy families and individuals and what should be taken into consideration. Thanks, Todd. Well, um, there are many risks and unfortunately there's no one organization or uh, individual that takes all of them into consideration um, uh, when it comes to fixing or addressing each one of those risks. Um, just to, to give a broad brush overview of what uh, some of the more common risks are. Obviously, um, lit litigation risk uh, directed at uh, your client's businesses uh, is, a, is a huge risk. And, and litigation comes from customers or suppliers, or it can come from regulators or landlords or the CRA, and the list goes on. So you might say, well, that's an easy one to eliminate. We can just buy some insurance uh, uh, to uh, address all of those. We can get uh, errors and omissions assure insurance. We can get product liability insurance, counterparty, public liability, uh, key person, uh, life insurance, and so on. And yeah, all of those are important tools, but it it would, it's very surprising how often insurance is improperly owned and uh, improperly fit into uh, the overall ownership structure. I guess another major uh, risk is a personal litigation risk. And that can be devastating and it can wipe out um, our client financially. And, and yes, there may be some insurance options there too, However, um, sometimes claims are rejected and sometimes, um, sometimes there is no insurance available for personal litigation. Um, 
I guess one of the bigger ones that we end up talking about to clients most often is um, matrimonial properties claims. Um, and, and it's a serious issue. In Canada, for example, um, over 50% of relationships and marriages end up in divorce or separation. And, uh, and, and I always question that. Um, however, I can say with some degree of authority that um, so far in the year 2022 in Canada, there have been 2 million 780,000 divorces recorded. Um, and, and by the way, on average, those kinds of claims, matrimonial properties claims, um, can be as high as 50% of your assets and or 50% of your income. Now, a lot of clients say, well, I'm not worried about a claim against me. But how can you predict uh, a claim against your children or your grandchildren? particularly if, leave, if you leave your, your assets outright to them, you may be putting family assets at risk. Another risk, a huge risk is taxation risk, whether it's income taxes or estate or inheritance taxes. Well, here in Canada, we don't have a state tax per se. However, we have a deemed capital gains tax on death. And many of our clients, including Mr. Diamond uh, that you saw earlier, will have assets scattered around the world um, in, in jurisdictions that do have a state tax, such as the UK, the United States, and, and in many countries in Europe. And, and uh, a state tax is an inheritance tax or a, a bad tax, if there's such a thing as a good tax or a bad tax. Um, and the reason why they're a bad tax is they're a capital tax. Uh, in the UK and the United States, for example, um, the estate and inheritance tax uh, are around 40% flat tax. And it's not 40% of your income, it's 40% of your gross assets. Um, and yeah, you can get life insurance and so on to address those, but sometimes just a simple change in ownership can provide um, similar or complementary risk relief. I guess another major risk would be uh, insolvency risk. Um, hard to predict, but um, but there's lots of opportunities to put assets out of harm's way into a safe place in the case of an insolvency. And, and there are many, many other risks that uh, I won't go into in any great detail, such as expropriation risk, citizenship and residency risk, critical illness, um, Cyber security, personal security, and you'll hear more about those later. So, um, in, in summary, uh, we think that uh, asset protection planning is the single most important aspect of your overall financial plan, um, uh, often called asset uh, preservation. In essence, it's a comprehensive plan which involves many aspects of planning including financial and tax plan, personal health care, critical illness, your will, your estate plan, your investment plan, your insurance plan, um, your personal security plan, your cybersecurity plan, plan for art and collector collectibles. How about your incarceration plan? John, I'm just yeah. wondering if we can have you elaborate on your next session there. We just hit the five minute mark. If that's Absolutely. All right. So thank you very much. That was fascinating. I'd like to call on Colonel Ram Dorr, please. Colonel Dorr, uh, could you please help our audience to understand why cybersecurity is something that we need to wake up and notice and take action on, please? Well, actually, um, first, I'd like to say that I'm excited to be here. Um, and it, it's not new that uh, cyber came into our life. Uh, I believe that we are all living in what we call the digital area, and I would rather call it the cybernetic area. And it's not only with the surrounding our business, it's when we send our small child with his smartphone and when he's surfing into sites, when he's harvesting information that he might not to be in contact with, or in any day or any case of our life. So we are all living in, in a digital area, cybernetic area based on those digital assets, and they are all combined 
with the aspect, with the issue of the risk. I believe that David Lespres, that which is a expert in risk, will will tell you that in any case you can use the, the old diagram that analyzing the level of risk by on one hand, let's see what is the probability that something would happen to us. On the other hand, what could be the impact of an event? Uh, and, and we would like to take out of those two, what could be the acceptance, acceptance risk or the acceptance uh, impact. Uh, but when we ask people, most of them doesn't know how to define their critical assets. What is important, what is not important. And in the background, when I speak about cyber, I think that the rules have been changed. The targets have been changed. So there used to be times when uh, the tools of the offensive used to be in the hands of nations and the targets were national assets. Nowadays, the assets become economical, they become people, they become citizens, they are all part of a nation, they are all part of an ecosystem of, of economic stability. So you can attack the private and influence the, the, the Dow Jones. And there's also, on the other hand, a proliferation of tools, which means tools that used to be in the hands of nations only have moved to be in the hands of non-state organization. And if we go back to the slide, the ones that uh, we, we put at the beginning, we can see that it's, it's all around different continents, no boundaries for the, uh, those effects. So what actually happened, if you can move to my next slide, please, is we can see that uh, there used to be times that we are all have been on the blue side. We were the customers, we were the defenders. And usually we are on our borders. Uh, that on our borders, I mean in between nation, in between our IT system, we had the firewall. And uh, uh, we used to use those items and we have a common kind of protecting our assets. On the other hand, it used to be the, used to be the attacker landscape. Uh, and what happens during the cybernetic area that those two areas has moved one towards the other. And the mix of those two in, in one of the others create new targets for the attackers, for the rivals on one hand, but it also give us options for us as a defenders to create a new protection line, a new strategy, maybe a new paradigm, how to uh, defend our assets. And we have to realize how the red zone look like. What are the threat of reference? What are the scenario? What are the attacker's goals or targets? It used to be the times when they're attacking the banks. That's why the banks are highly regulated. But what was the, about the pharma industry on the slide before? What about critical infrastructure? And then on, the, on our side, can we define what are the critical assets? So what we recommend later on during the conversation is to try to diffuse the red line and the blue line and cre create a new purple line. We call it the new paradigm of, of purple. I call it deep purple. Let's evaluate what is the fusion of the attacker's perspective with the defender's perspective and create a new line of, of uh, uh, protection. And when I mean that, we cannot use anymore only the firewall. We have to go beyond our boundaries, like the customers, or like, excuse me, like the attackers is going beyond his boundaries. It means if you used to have Intel, for example, let's use Intel sources to uh, direct our security means in order to have strategies built on defining critical assets, having direction using uh, bright intelligence and cyber intelligence and put the, uh, the defensive line surrounding our defensive objectives. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, uh, Colonel Ram. That was very, very useful. Um, I'd like to now think about why not insure human assets? We insure buildings, cars, everything else. Um, what is the vulnerabilities? What are the eventualities? Uh, I'd like to call on Jordan. Jordan, if you could please talk to the audience about what sort of eventualities they need to be concerned about. Well, thank you very much, Todd. I uh, appreciate that and the introduction. Um, I was wondering if we could please bring up the uh, slide uh, showing our case study, actually, so I could uh, explain just some of the uh, eventual risks that every that every shareholder will be open to. And 
every every shareholder will be facing at some point in the future, but uh, also how it relates specifically to uh, our case study of uh, of Mr. Diamond that we have here. Um, so um, one particularly large uh, liability that uh, Mr. Diamond will be facing upon uh, his uh, inevitable death or even uh, disability or or uh, perhaps in, in the event that he, he were to contract a, a serious illness, for example, um, would be uh, key person expenses that would be incurred upon um, him being unable to perform certain duties within his, uh, his corporate empire. So upon, upon the death of a, of a shareholder of a company, if he's as a, as a major part in its operations, um, there's oftentimes losses across the board in uh, areas such as um, staff turnovers, for example, staff that are losing confidence with the, uh, his uh, possible replacement on that executive team, for example. Um, there's also, uh, in some circumstances, banks or financial institutions that are offering financing to his group of companies may perhaps lose confidence and, and, and perhaps uh, may be unwilling to provide um, financing to the uh, group of companies at the time of transition. Um, there could be uh, business losses um, on, on the part of uh, clients, for example, and there's substantial expenses that uh, might be incurred um, in terms of uh, hiring a replacement for Mr. Diamond to be able to fill the uh, responsibilities that he's been filling, that he's been, uh, that he's been uh, undertaking at his group of companies. Um, in addition to that, that, there's very substantial tax liabilities that uh, John McLeod had, uh, had mentioned. Here in Canada, as, uh, as John said, uh, really at the time of death, both corporate assets and personal assets that are held uh, by Mr. Diamond would be uh, deemed to be disposed of. And so the capital gains tax rate that we have here in Canada is 25% of the gain of such assets. So as he does hold a substantial um, corporation that uh, specializes in multi-residential real estate, there could be a very large uh, capital gains tax bill that would be incurred upon uh, the disposition of those, uh, of those properties. And then also um, for each corporation that he holds here in Canada, those assets will also be disposed of and has half capital gains taxes payable upon his death. Uh, in the US, as, uh, as John mentioned as well, they, uh, his uh, real estate would be uh, possibly subject to uh, an estate tax value, a state tax rate of 40%, which would also be um, a similar rate that would be incurred within the United Kingdom, for example. And uh, if he has uh, real estate or corporations in Mexico, they could perhaps be uh, subject to an inheritance tax rate of 25%, for example. Um, and uh, in addition to that, if we're talking about um, disability risk, for example, or critical illness risk, even though he, uh, Mr. Diamond may still be alive in that event, he, would, he may not be able to perform, perform duties within his, uh, his group of companies. And so how is the proper planning in place to be able to provide for any of these eventualities? Are there, um, is there liquidity in place to be able to pay for tax liabilities or key person expenses upon his death? Has there been um, proper estate planning done or proper corporate restructuring of his group of companies to be able to mitigate or, or reduce these tax liabilities? Those would be some of the main concerns that I would have uh, just based on, on the structure that we have here. And those would be some of the question marks that I would have as well. Great. Well, thank you very much, Jordan. Well, um, while we have this on, on the, the screen here, uh, I'd like to call upon David Lesbrance. Um, David, I would like you to um, give us some insight on to, into some of the things that might not be as obvious to some of us and help us to understand where some of these risks may be uh, lurking. <laughs> be good, please, David. Uh, absolutely. Um... So if we're looking at Mr. Diamond, we've got him as a Canadian citizen and a Canadian uh, resident for tax purposes. You'll also see uh, off to his side uh, a flag. Um, uh, I'm not sure which, uh, it's the Polish flag, uh, so that he has some Polish, Polish lineage. So that's an opportunity that may be able to get a Polish uh, passport and that doesn't just open up Poland to him, that opens up 27 different countries in the EU and his spouse. Uh, and also Mr. Diamond is Jewish, which opens up Israel, uh, Aliyah and the law of return, 
which is not a, just another passport, but both the Polish and the Israeli passports also open up potential opportunities for moving and changing tax residents. Um, Israel, for example, has a has a 10 year uh, tax, very attractive tax holiday. Several of the EU countries have have very attractive uh, tax holidays. Um, when we look over to the Canadian son, uh, that again would have a, a claim through father on uh, a, a Polish citizenship, has a Canadian again from birth. We'll talk a bit further in the case study about risks in the UK of acquiring citizenship or domicile there. Um, the son uh, number two below beside the American flag We'll talk about whether he is a green card holder. What status does he have in the United States? Is he a Canadian on a on a TN, which is a treaty national, which is non-immigrant? Is he a green card holder? Is he a uh, a citizen? Uh, likewise, uh, the youngest son. So we're will be a Canadian. What is his status in Mexico? Should he eventually take out Mexican citizenship? We'll talk about in the context later on of of the uh, um the case study how all these are both risks and opportunities but if you want to go now uh to my introductory slide so we're gonna we're to to my uh to my slide yeah. so um Again, when we look at, at, at risks, one of the things that Canadians and North Americans discovered during the pandemic, which was quite a rude awakening, is the fact that we thought we have an excellent uh, travel document that allowed us to go around the world, and all of a sudden we couldn't. And that was where things like a European passport would have increased mobility significantly. Uh, I remember flying into Belize during the SARS epidemic. And uh, I happened to have a Canadian passport and they treated me uh, as if I was, you know, in hazmat suits, etc. cetera. Uh, so loss of mobility is something you don't take into account until it's gone. Remember, most of the world doesn't have as much mobility as Canadians or Americans do. Another big concern that a lot of, of our clients have our increased taxation. That taxation may be based on residence. It may be in the case of the United States also based on citizenship and estate tax, a concept we have as, as domicile. Uh, and another interesting uh, um, motivation that we're seeing for a lot of clients is what I'll call societal and political unrest. I've been dealing with um, North American clients now for 30 plus years, including Americans. And traditionally, for example, uh, a lot of that was driven by taxation. But uh, I've increasingly got a, a, a number of, of clients and multi-generational families um, who are worried about, uh, quite frankly, I've got a, a group of clients who uh, are proud Americans, but they don't want to live in a mega America. Likewise, I've got other clients who just you know, the polarization, um, the situation, the societal unrest. I have a, a, a client who said, statistically, I know my young children are not going to be part of a mass shooting event, but I know with 100% certainty, they're going to have to go through active shooter drills. And I just don't want that for my family. So we'll talk about in the case study, some practical examples of how all these fit in. Well, thank you very much, David. That's great. Uh, Ranker, let's just go back and we'll summarize some of the things. Let's look at that main diagram again, please. As uh, Anchor's pulling that up, I'll, I'll, I'll start off by saying that um, our group, uh, our consortium is trained to be able to, to identify vulnerabilities and ensure longevity. And one of the things that we're always focusing on as we see our clients that are uh, able to generate significant amounts of wealth, we want to first protect what they have. And we've noticed you know, a few things that is highly problematic that I'll just add. One of the things that um, oftentimes is not considered 
is whether or not limited liability is sufficient. Well, it seems as though Mr. Diamond's advisors believe that limited liability is all that's needed. Well, limited liability is just as the term says, right? It is limited. Not that it necessarily means that, but it happens to be so. I'd suggest that there's all sorts of different problems in today's economy that uh, causes concern. Uh, we see individuals uh, who have become insolvent because of some of the changes in the world. And we also see situations where creditors come out of the woodwork. And sometimes predators come out of the woodwork. Whether it's a cybersecurity predator or a predator of another kind, that can be seeking to take advantage of wealthy individuals. And one of the things that this, these people don't have is any protection at the top. Mr. Diamond is entirely vulnerable, as is his entire empire. In the event of a lawsuit against Mr. Diamond, there really isn't anything there to protect him from losing all that he has. Uh, we also are talking about you know, some of the, the different issues that we might want to consider, and that would be the cost of capital. The increasing cost of capital and in increasing interest rates might play havoc with Mr. Diamond's holdings. Uh, as an example, there might be leveraged plays that he gets involved with, uh, say in the multi-residential area, possibly in green energy, where it can uh, significantly affect profitability. It can mean that you have a, a winner or a loser. It can mean that you have all sorts of issues. I'd also point out that on the very, very bottom of the slide, we have concerns that I alluded to earlier. Um, an LLC in the United States is, you know, uh, it can be a corporation to check your box options. It's treated like a corporation from a Canadian point of view. It's treated like a partnership. It has physical transparency. Um, part of the issue that we're going to be talking about is we have a mismatch between a healthcare corporation on the top, which, by the way, presents loss of capital gains exemptions. We're talking a lot about very important things. Your entire estate can crumble because of risks such as taxation. One of the issues we talked about at the very beginning is excessive tax. Excessive tax is what's happening to this family. This, And we see so many families just like this that have done absolutely nothing to protect their assets and very little to protect against excessive taxation. One of the things that Mr. Diamond needs to consider is how he can position himself so that the family can inherit the shares and that there's not going to be a need for a forced liquidity event at an unwanted time. One thing that uh, you can plan for is a sale of a company. Um, you can't plan your death. Well, I guess you can, but it's not recommended, um, nor desirable in most cases. So I'd suggest that it would be best to be able to arrange your affairs so that you're protecting against the inevitable. And when I'm saying inevitable, well, it's inevitable that we're going to be paying tax. It's inevitable that we're going to die. It's inevitable that we are going to have individuals taking advantage of, of us. And it's also inevitable that there will be cybersecurity attacks against um, our world. And it's already, as I mentioned, recognized under the OECD, on the OECD's website, which I uh, found quite interesting. I'd also suggest that there's mismatches because this individual is getting advice in silos. He might go to um, an accountant and a lawyer and get advice on what he should do, but in reality, it's too separated. It's not harmonized. So one of the things that our family office really likes to do is to harmonize advice so that it makes sense from a tax point of view. And we really find that, you know, you lawyers and accountants that are in attendance today, I think it's very, very important, you know, that when you consider these issues, that you involve an expert on each of each of the things. And that's that's important because ignoring one item can mean uh, a catastrophic event. Um, in the United in in, um, in in Colombia, as an example, and in UAE, we we've uh, commingled uh, foreign and domestic assets. We've lost the possibility for a capital gains exemption for Mr. Diamond and his family for his estate. Well, there might not be one capital gains exemption. There could be a dozen or more. There could be millions of dollars of lost capital gains exemptions because it's conceivable that the shares of these companies could be QSBC shares. But when you're commingling active assets with non-active assets, that's a problem. Multi-residential real estate underneath of a hold code, 
with a healthcare company, please. Um, we're very, very accustomed to seeing co-mingling of active and non-active assets, co-mingling of foreign and, and domestic assets. We're suggesting that there's a dozen good reasons not to do this. All right, so let's move back into our questions for our panelists. And I'd like to go back to John for a moment. And John, I'd like to call on you to help us to understand another question, if you don't mind. So, uh, John, sure. um, you've been involved with um, risk management most of your life. You have managed trust companies around the world. Um, how do you see this kind of scenario as far as the types of solutions that might be advantageous? Uh, John, please help us to understand what's important from an asset protection point of view. Sure, and just to follow up on what you just said, uh, why is asset protection important? Is, and, and to summarize what you're saying is, number one, it can save you millions of dollars at death or even before death. Number two, it uh, prevents um, unpleasant surprises uh, from devastating your life or the, or the lives of your children and grandchildren. Um, the process of um, uh, asset protection allows you to uh, evaluate numerous potential uh, problems and establish solutions for each one of them. And asset protection really should be an integral part of your overall estate plan. Um, and I guess finally, it gives you and your next generation some peace of mind that you've uh, taken every consideration into account. Uh, and what we found over the years is that um, a, a robust uh, asset protection strategy can't be affected without the direct involvement of each client's primary trusted financial advisor, whether it's the client's lawyer or accountant or tax advisor or family office or banker or investment advisor or insurance advisor. Uh, it's critical that somebody on the client's uh, advisory team is involved in the process. In fact, in, fact uh, in, in our company, we will not do an asset protection strategy for a client without the direct involvement of the client's advisor. Now that might strange, it might seem strange, uh, but the long-term benefits to the client are tremendous if their advisors are involved in the process. Um, we found that um, without the advisor, the plans aren't often executed. Um, the structure and strategy is probably not well understood by the client or the next generation. And we've also noticed that not, uh, not any advisor has skills in all of the areas that uh, are part of this process. Um, does your lawyer have experience in healthcare? Does your accountant have experience in emergency funds? Who's the specialist in cyber and personal security and insurance and so on? And so um, we, we require a team approach to doing uh, asset protection. And we often use trusts as uh, a structure, sometimes foundations as a structure. And in 99.9% .9 of the times, there's also a corporate structure underneath that. Um, and that's all a function of law and the history of trusts, if you will. Trusts have been around for 900 odd years. They began uh, uh, during the Crusades. Well, they, they began in two places at the same time. Um, they began when the Crusades uh, occurred and, um, and local nobility was run, uh, rushing off to, uh, to fight the holy wars and may or may not come back. Um, and also uh, around the same time, there was a debate uh, in the Catholic church as to who owned the assets. Was it the church that owned the assets or was it the parishioners that owned the assets? And, uh, and so the whole body of law in common law evolved um, out of those two occurrences. And, and a trust or a foundation for that matter allows one person, uh, usually called the settlor, to transfer assets to another person, usually called the trustee, but for the exclusive benefit of a third party or group of parties called the beneficiaries. And therein is how we get the concept of asset protection in trusts and foundations as an overarching structure. 
we've transferred um, all of the assets away from the original contributor and put them in a class for the benefit of the beneficiaries. And in fact, um, the contributor uh, or settlor has no further role or responsibility unless he's part of the uh, of the beneficiary class as well. And um, the other thing that's important is jurisdiction, um, the rule of Elizabeth, which uh, which was established by Queen Elizabeth the uh, first, which created the rules of equity. Um, uh, have become a problem. Uh, for example, Canada is has become a um, a creditor friendly jurisdiction, whereas many other jurisdictions are not as creditor friendly. And that's the reason why they're not is because they've either not adopted the rule of Elizabeth or they've adopted different legislation that eliminates that. So the selection of the jurisdiction is critically important. And there are a dozen different types of of trusts, everything from reserve power trusts to um, star trusts to foundations in civil law countries, all of which can be used to be the overall um, ownership structure. And we work on each one of them, um, each client situation with the client's advisor to pick the best structure and the best jurisdiction and the best service deliverer in that jurisdiction. Excellent. Well, that's very uh, insightful, John. Um, when we're busy, you know, protecting assets at the shareholder level at the very top, is it not remiss for us not to consider uh, the assets within a corporation, such as the digital assets, such as uh, other critical areas that sometimes get overlooked? I'd like to call on Colonel Dorr to please talk to us again about what kinds of solutions might be available for individuals such as Mr. Dunn. Thank you, Todd and uh, John. And uh, as you all said, the, the issue here is the complexity. And you described it very well, Todd. There's a tense, the tense in between the line of businesses, the tense in between the difference in the continents and the regulation and the law. And uh, as far as I see it here, it looks like the expert from the taxation, from the legal, and from the cyber realize they are all having the same target, which means we should maybe orchestrate the, the event here. So on one hand, there's a kind of a segmentation in between the line of businesses, the, the problems, the challenges. On the other hand, the one who is navigating the ship doesn't control the whole business. And if you orchestrate it for him, it might look different. So what we would like to offer is, is the kind of orchestration that needed here. And it's all start with defining the critical assets. And I spoke with, uh, about it in the previous uh, session. And I, I give a, um, a small example of what happened to me a few years ago when I was consulting for a huge petrol company here in Israel that have a few hundreds petrol companies, it's have tankers at the sea, it's have coffee shops and all kinds of those things. And I was asking the CEO, so can you take only the petrol station and tell me what is your critical assets? And the common answer is, of course, it's the pump where I produce petrol for the cars. And a simple question like, but where do you gain the biggest revenue? because the revenue on, on the gas because of taxation and other issue and regulation is very small. You say, hey, no, no, no. It's the convenience store, which is more important for me from the business uh, aspect, from the business point of view. So we started taking the convenience store and look at on the point of sale. And the point of sale is also controlling the pump. So the the segmentation surrounding and the protection layer surrounding it is more important. And if you can move me to the next slide, please, my, my slide was the, this one. So actually those small pieces of assets, we called it Wolf's Island. And Lupi like to offer a protection on one hand for each island. It could be a business, it could be a person, it could be the, the residence, it could be the airplane, it could be the ship. Um, and then integrate a coherent 
security which is related to what he have in that assets. It's not only the digital assets, it's also the physical aspects, and it depends if there's threat of reference. And we will put in the middle the defensive objectives. We surround them with the integrated defensive shield, a few layers of security. It will have also the taxation there, the legal, but it also will have the security means. It will also have the intelligence direction that will help him build the right uh, surroundings, though, uh, surrounding those, uh, uh, those assets. If you can click it, another click, please. So you can see it can control, go, go the whole, the whole way. So if you bring to a one, uh, security operation center. You bring on one hand the CCTV. You bring the access control. You build. You bring the resident. You, build, you bring the ship. You bring the digital asset. You can help him control and, and get a new sense of of situation awareness. So we would like to create an integrated defensive shield, that the one that will affect the protecting on the business. On one hand, the continuity business. On the other, other hand, if you use the right way, the intelligence, you might even create a new intelligence advantage, a new business advantage using this kind of intelligence. And I was speaking about intelligence, I'm speaking about when Mr. Diamond is going to Colombia, he'd like to get an assessment of what is the situation in Colombia. If he's going to the UK, he'd like to know what is the assessment in the level of cyber, in the level of crime, in the level of economic stability. So why don't get the right report? Why don't uh, review what kind of line of business you like to open there? What kind of advantage you like to uh, do there? And if it's all in a fusion center mm -hmm. and you help him to control it, and I really believe in what uh, John uh, said uh, previously, that uh, the stakeholders should be involved very deeply in the strategy that you build. We can build him and help him orchestrate all those kind of, uh, of effort and bring a new pro proactive uh, approach to that uh, uh, field. We won't be only in our perimeter. We will be on one head on the perimeter, but we'll go beyond by orchestrating everything into one coherent cyber protection layer. Thank you. Well, that's amazing. Um, the whole concept of creating barriers for protection is not only logical, but it also is effective. I'd like to thank you for that, Dr. Or sorry, Colonel uh, Dorr. Um, also, I'd like to call on Jordan and have Jordan speak to us about some potential solutions that may exist, given the fact that there all are inevitabilities. There's um, obviously things to be worried about that uh, Jordan identified in pa uh, the previous portion. So Jordan, let's talk about uh, how the um, Mr. Diamond can benefit from sure. some things available. Sure. Thank you, Tom. And so, uh, as, as you mentioned actually earlier, I mean, it's uh, very difficult to be able to predict one's death. And, and I mean, Mr. Diamond may be quite proactive in terms of trying to create a, a robust group of companies, a robust empire that would uh, facilitate a succession to his children um, in, in an effective manner. But um, as Todd said, it's, it's, we, we can't predict when, when his death might be, and we can't predict what sort of circumstances may come up. Um, prior to prior to uh, Mr. Diamond's death, and so at that point, it's really necessary for uh, Mr. Diamond to look at uh, guarantees that would be able to cover many of the liabilities that we've uh, we've mentioned already, such as tax liabilities, um, liquidity risks, um, replacement costs, et cetera, and really uh, life insurance is. Uh, a solution that uh, Mr. Diamond needs to be looking into that would be able to provide a guaranteed death benefit in that case. And um, really to be able to facilitate these type of policies, I uh, wanted to just bring up uh, the corporate diagram that uh, would be able to shed some more light on a potential scenario that would be advantageous for uh, Mr. Diamond. Anchor, would you mind pulling up the corporate diagram? And so, uh, Todd, did you want to just give a, a brief uh, Introduction to the audience about the structure. Yeah, so this is just your basic standard boring estate freeze, right? <laughs> so in Canada, for those of you in the US, we can't do estate freezes in the United States and most other countries, I would say the same is true. Um, essentially, for those of you in Canada, all we're really talking about doing is freezing, limiting, mitigating, uh, or otherwise capping uh, the tax risk, capping the value of the companies that you own. 
and pushing the future growth up into a trust. Now, in this particular case, we've gone to a jurisdiction that uh, John has spent uh, a good part of his working career in Barbados, where they do not have the statute of Elizabeth. They do not have uh, the same uh, onerous uh, legislation or the same onerous case law even that we have in Canada. So we've got, what we've done is set up a trust to have all the future growth go to so we protected the assets. In doing all of this, we've created a conduit, conduit to be able to move money from UAE, from USA, from um, Capital Co and Sherco, all the money can be moved up to the trust and it can be pushed back into this company, a special purpose vehicle we're calling Sherco. And in this case, we're putting in maybe a million dollars a year into a life insurance policy. And Jordan, explain why we put so much money into a life insurance policy, explain what, what it will do for the client, for Mr. Diamond, explain uh, the tax benefits and explain the benefit to the family. Sure, sure, absolutely. And so within this specific example, we would have, um, we'd be recommending either um, a universal life insurance policy or a whole life insurance policy, um, as opposed to a, a term life insurance policy. Um, I mean, term life insurance policies, they, they do have their, their benefits certainly, but one of the shortcomings is that they become quickly unaffordable um, as a, uh, as the uh, insured advances in age. So, I mean, really above the, the age of 50 or the age of 60, for example, when term life insurance policies are renewed, are renewed the uh, net cost of pure insurance increases substantially, perhaps at a twofold or, or, or a threefold level. And so that's why uh, oftentimes, for example, uh, like Mr. Diamond, with the type of tax liabilities that he would have with such a substantial uh, asset portfolio, as well as uh, combined uh, corporate value, um, Permanent life insurance policies are oftentimes much more prudent to be able to guarantee the uh, correct um, or the uh, desired return on their investment. As um, life insurance is held within a corporation, permanent life insurance specifically, uh, grows tax-free in its cash surrender value, and there is no tax that will be payable either on the death benefit of the insurance policy. Um, linking back really to the value of a guarantee, um, I mean, this structure itself provides many benefits to uh, Mr. Diamond without the insurance. I mean, there's uh, the ability to multiply the capital gains exemption. There's the ability to be able to pass future tax liabilities on to the next generation. But um, corporate restructuring, corporate planning like this is uh, possibly subject to, to change according to changing legislation in the jurisdiction um, that the planning has been done. But life insurance policies with a guaranteed cash or under value are not. And so uh, that's why it's oftentimes uh, prudent to be able to combine life insurance with conventional tax planning, just to be able to add an additional layer of protection for the, for, for the client when uh, upon their death, as well as upon uh, potential disability or, uh, or critical illness of the, uh, of the insured. But um, within the specific structure that we have here, um, the insurance policy, it's designed to really pick up from where the estate freeze leaves, leaves off. And so cover future tax liabilities that are not provided by the capital gains tax exemption to be able to cover estate taxes that are, again, not, uh, not provided for by the estate freeze itself, as well as key person expenses that would be incurred upon the, uh, the death of Mr. Diamond. And then uh, the funding structure that we have here would enable Mr. Diamond to move funds through the holding company, through the trust, back down into the insurance company, where the, well, the insure co, which is a special purpose vehicle, where the uh, premium will be paid every year. Um, from there, on the right side of the diagram, we have uh, a funding mechanism pictured that would enable the, uh, Mr. Diamond to be able to enhance his personal cash flow by using an asset of the uh, special purpose vehicle in the insurance policy itself. And so um, we have pictured here a $250,000 premium that will be paid from the insurance, from, from the special purpose vehicle towards the insurance company. From there, there will be a collateral assignment of the life insurance policy and all of its value to a bank or financial institution. Um, in return for receiving the collateral assignment, the bank would then issue a loan, which would, which in some cases can be 100% equivalent to the premium that's being paid out every year towards a life insurance policy. So shortly after making the insurance premium, then Mr. Diamond would be receiving 
um, a $250,000 loan that would be received tax-free from the bank. And so that loan would, would either be received personally by Mr. Diamond, or the loan could also be repaid back to the uh, special purpose vehicle to finance payment of the premiums on an ongoing basis. But if um, Mr. Diamond seeks um, personal cash flow, the advantage is that there would not be any income tax to be payable upon the receival of this loan. And there would not be any dividend taxes payable by a special purpose vehicle either to be able to issue a dividend to Mr. Diamond. So the main needs that are being taken care of here are um, tax liabilities, key person expense liabilities that would be incurred by Mr. Diamond, but at the same time, it would be ensuring a, a tax-free cash flow towards Mr. Diamond every year. So it would benefit him not only upon his death, but also on an ongoing basis while he's alive. Thank you, Jordan. Uh, I'd like to now call on uh, David Lesperance. David uh, had given us uh, some very disconcerting things to think about, and I'm myself anxious to hear what the solutions are. David, can you please help us to have better focus on, on how you deal with these situations? Um, sure. I mentioned if you can, if people remember back to Mr. Diamond, uh, Canadian passport holder, a uh, Canadian tax resident, uh, could have a claim for Alia, um, uh, Israeli passport, uh, could have a claim for Polish lineage citizenship, which would pass on to his three sons. Uh, that gives them the ability to move. Um, uh, gives a uh, the ability to live, work, and, and travel wherever they wanted for extended periods of time throughout 27 different EU countries. The risk for Canada is a uh, very enterprising liberal MP from Nepean about a year ago said, why don't we tax based on citizenship like our Americans? Um, that didn't go anywhere so far, but, you know, that is something to consider. Um, we oftentimes will have people say, I, I will never move. I have a lot of life inertia. Everything is exactly where I'm at. And they say, never say never. I have a lot of New Yorkers. Uh, who, of course, when they thought that they were leaving the Isle of Manhattan to go on bridge and tunnels to New Jersey or Brooklyn, they just, you know, the world was Manhattan. All of a sudden, the pandemic hit. They moved, you know, they were forced out of the city. They went up to Connecticut and said, you know, all of a sudden they were saying, oh, oh my God, uh, um, you know, Amazon Prime will deliver this within a certain Within uh, 24 hours, uh, oh, my favorite restaurants have, I can get that delivered by Uber Eats. And that distance, once they kind of overcame that life inertia, um, all of a sudden they started saying, well, am I really going to go back to the taxation in, in New York, which is one of the most expensive jurisdictions uh, in North America because it has a federal, state, and city surtax. And that's where you saw a lot of them moving to once they kind of broke that life inertia, moving to places like Florida. Likewise, Canadians, I can't imagine ever leaving Canada. Well, what if there's citizenship-based taxation? What if there's a wealth tax? What if the cost of staying was greater than the, the cost of overcoming that life inertia? Um, you want to have the optionality to be able to do that. That's where having multiple citizenships and residences uh, come in handy. Um, we have a distinct advantage in the Americas that these were immigration destination countries in the you know, 19th and 20th and 21st century. So large proportions of the population will have claim to some lineage citizenship. If they don't, we're now seeing a lot of them saying, well, I'm going to plant the seed of an EU passport in a place like Portugal, for example. I'll water it appropriately with a certain amount of physical presence, fairly minimal, and that will bear the fruit of an EU citizenship five years down the road. And so we're seeing you know, that type of move happen. And one of the things that, that, that uh, all of the speakers have been talking about is that whatever planning comes in should be integrated and it must be livable. I like to say whatever backup plan you have, not only can you does it have to make sense at the boardroom table, but you have to sell it at the breakfast table. 
if you've got family members who don't want to do certain things the the, the or, or don't feel comfortable or understand for example trust etc um that's a real problem um other countries uh have significant sovereign risks uh i'm seeing a large movement out of china right now because wealthy clients are basically saying i don't want to be the next jack ma i have a sovereign risk i'm worried about the sovereign uh, taking taking away things and you have to remember when you look at your passport it's not your passport it's the one your government allows you to use right up to the moment that they don't allow you to use it and that may be uh, um, because you're you're a threat to a power center for example in a place like China or Saudi Arabia or Russia it may be uh, that you're uh your country became a bit of a pariah for example we're watching events in in hungary right now um that may end up resulting in hungary being kicked out of the eu and it being very difficult for hungarians to move around um so you always have to be conscious of these things and and north americans really took that for granted oh it'll never happen here and the pandemic really shook up a lot of people because all of a sudden they couldn't flip open National Geographic Traveler and go wherever they wanted to. Um, and as we get into the specifics of the case study in that discussion, we can kind of go into a few more of the, the very specific uh, situations and uh, and how it integrates with things like, like trust and personal security. Right. Well, that was a, a fascinating uh, example. David, I, I really like what you, what you had to say there about not taking things for granted, not being too sure of where one's living. You mentioned Manhattan. You mentioned some of the most, uh, uh, I'm going to say, uh, places where you, people you would never think would be leaving. And since this is the case, uh, individuals are on the move. Uh, I think your concept of being uh, creating portability or movability or whatever the word is, is a, a very important Mobility. Part. Mobility. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, all right, Anchor, let's move us into our roundtable discussion. And now we're going to be uh, talking a little bit about some of these things. I want to just launch right in, uh, if we don't mind. Um, I want to see that diagram again, Anchor, please. And we'll use that as a catalyst to be able to talk about a lot of different things. So I guess what I'd like to do is uh, talk about, before we go further, um, the cost of capital. And if an individual is involved in any of these areas, there may be some provisions within the United Nations 17 goals for sustainability that I'd like to point out. Uh, I've had some colleagues that have been involved in COP27 out of Egypt and who came to us and said, well, look, we have a number of different uh, uh, nations and various different groups uh, that are prepared to uh, provide um, funds for companies that are interested in expansion. And uh, through this COP27, there was a brokering, as I understand it, of deals. And there are opportunities for companies to be able to acquire capital, potentially at a at amount that's far less than what it might be. And some of the individuals that we work with or indiv individuals that have been involved with, you know, UN ops and other groups that uh, provide, I think, interesting ideas because when we're considering, as an example, multi-residential real estate, I'm just going to put it out there as a beginning of, of, of some of the things to think about, uh, there's always an effort to increase rents, right? You, you rent control issues, people leave, there's turnover. When you have a multi-residential building, well, one of the things they're looking at is, you know, do we upgrade the building? Do we upgrade the units? Do we put in, you know, stainless steel appliances and, and granite countertops and new elevator cars and waterfalls and fireplaces? Do we do things like that? We, and, and if we do, what about inflation? We have very, very high interest rates that have caused a lack of affordability. We've had um, very, very difficult situations for many people. Can people pay rent? Can people pay a higher rent? Uh, so to individuals involved with multi-residential real estate, there might be good opportunities from that point of view to be able to decide, well, if, if the cost of capital could be 50% less, how does that make any sense? What about companies involved in global expansion? What about companies in the green energy space, healthcare, medical devices? These are all areas that the UN uh, and ESG kind of models work for, where there may be opportunities through this um, through our consortium. So the consortium, as you can see, really wants to solve a 
a multitude of problems that aren't usually that clear. So I'm going to basically start by calling on various different members, and we'd like to have an exchange. I'd like to invite everybody to jump in whenever they want. And I'm going to start off by talking about uh, certain kinds of, of risks. And I want to ask a question. Um, first, I'm going to call on Ram. Uh, Ram, what can be done for Mr. Diamond's yacht? He obviously is concerned with security. He's one of the top 100 wealthiest people in Canada, say, and uh, or maybe 500 people in Canada. He's pretty wealthy, and he, he's a target. His kids are a target. He's a target. What can be done about the fact that he's out in the middle of who knows where? Help us to understand what, what, what uh, you could do about that, please. Well, thank you for the question. The yacht is the only place I wanted to know uh, to want to be at the moment. Uh, but uh, again, as I said before, I believe we can build uh, uh, the right uh, protection capsula surrounding this yacht. This yacht is probably docking regularly in Canada and from time to time it's traveling to other places in Canada and in other continents. So the threats are changing. So uh, such a, um, a ship will have some threats starting from where it's docking, where it's sailing. Are there pirates there? Uh, what, uh, how, what is the level of, of safety where you are docking? So I, like always, I will start with a kind of uh, security review of what is happening on the ship. Does it have any security means on it? What is the threat of reference when it's docking, when people on it? And uh, the threats are changing. There's a certain time that the, the threat is a physical on the people or on the boat itself. There are times where the threat is on the system on the boat. It could be on the RF communication. It could be on the privacy. Are there any drones surrounding? What is the scenario? So I will put a capsula which have a, a multi-layered protection. Uh, most of it will be the physical layer with combined with technology which means it's going to, get a, going to have a dedicated team to run the ship. It's going to, be, going to be probably VIP protection when it's sailing to continent with a level of threats that needs that kind of protection. I will probably will cover the, the, the yacht with a kind of visual content using CCTV cameras or other issues. And... Um, I will probably add to that some technological solutions like anti-drone, like keeping on the communication on the ship that would we have continuity that no one, no one can do an RF jamming or thing, thing of that kind. So there will be a whole capsula surrounding that ship. But you, you asked me about the ship and I wanna take a glimpse into the whole picture because the, we started with the complexity of the, of the picture. And I would ask to put the slide with the, analysis, how to anal an analyze what kind of threats there are. And excuse me, there are some changes in, in the slide, but it doesn't mean it changes in the, the, the review. So basically, I will start with a kind of review. What is the level of risk in the UK? And I will divide the risk assessment into three uh, levels. One would be the, one of them will be the uh, st stability, and the stability is the political situation, the economical situation, and the national security. Then I would look into the cyber. cyber in cyber, we, we usually review what we call the CIA, which means the confidentiality, the integrity, and the availability. And then I will go into security and safety, which means probably what is the level of crime in that uh, uh, country. And I rated like, you know, what, what I realized in the UK, so you can see that most of the threats on the physical level are on the yellow are very low, but on the cyber, the, the, uh, the threats are higher, although UK is regulated. So on, on the level of going into businesses or having businesses in, in the UK, consider having a kind of a strategy that will mitigate the threats that are oriented to your businesses. As in the physical issue, I will consider for Mr. Diamond, since you're a VIP person, once you're traveling beyond your Canadian border, consider according to the level of threat, if to use a kind of VIP protection and so on and so on. And what, after it, I'll, I will, if you can jump, I did the same analysis for Canada, okay? 
you can see it's almost the the, the same uh, smaller regulation than the UK in the level in the uh, aspect of SADA. Another uh, click, please. And you can see that uh, it changes in Mexico because in Mexico you can see a higher threat both on, on the economic side, which I would rate at medium, and also on the crime and, and uh, security and safety. So consider using different level of security, either using a local partner. And the idea is when you have everything coherented into one center, we can provide you the analysis before you're going. And it's it's related to the ship, it's related to the person who's traveling, it's related to, to the business. And I do almost the same analysis when I'm analyzing the business itself, but this is another click. So I, when I'm, an, 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 I do the analysis for the, uh, for the senior care in UK, like he have at the business there. Again, I review the cyber issue and I will take three aspects, the data breach, potential because there are people who are having their uh, privacy and data inside your system. The other issue is the data integrity and, and the level of threat would be medium. So I consider to adopt a strategy that will mitigate databases issue. And uh, along with some consideration about combining physical security because those are elderly people, there might be someone who like to uh, use the, their uh, vulnerability. So I would recommend using some level of security surrounding uh, the assets. So that's the, the coherent analysis and the solution. If you, another click, and I wouldn't take your time for a long, and another click, another click, raise them all up, all the uh, purple ones. So surrounding each island or each, we create a new wolf to protect the island and the threats are changing. The threat on green energy, which is critical infrastructure is different and the impact is different. It's an operational issue. It's not only the issue of money. When you're going to real estate, we are now speaking about maybe involving internet of things, IOT infrastructure in those buildings. If you go to the mining, um, crypto mining, it might have some kind of need to involve secure development in his processes. If you're going to the medical, there is threat maybe to life if there are medical devices depend on digital assets. So every island will get the right solution to fit the processes, the product and what you're doing in that uh, area. And that's the idea when you're mitigating such a threat. Thank you. Very good, thank you, Colonel Dorr. Um, I'd like to call on John McLeod to talk a little bit more about, you know, why use trust? We talked about mistake freeze a few minutes ago in our illustration. Maybe for the time being, go back to that illustration again, would you please, Edgar? And while we're waiting for Edgar to pull that up, uh, John, you gave us some history about trust. But what is probably not that clear to the audience is what are the reasons to use a trust? Uh, help us to understand that better, please. Well, some of the obvious things that come out of the case study to me uh, are, um, you know, the, you've got uh, a husband, a wife, and several children. Um, and uh, and if the Canadian company is a QSBC, then there's a $930,000 lifetime capital gains exemption available. Uh, Anchor, oh, sorry, sorry, John, I don't want to spoil what you're saying. Anchor, please go to the other slide, the, the one that Jordan was talking from. Sorry, John. Yep, there you go. Okay. Please continue. So uh, some of the so leveraging the nine hundred and thirty thousand dollar capital gains exemption it would be a bit of a no brainer uh, from my uh, perspective. Um, um, the uh, there's obviously litigation risk around uh, and matrimonial properties risks. So getting assets out of the name of the client is critical. You've got um, UK and US and um, and uh, uh, Mexican assets where there's uh, estate taxes or capital taxes and just by removing the the individuals as the owners and putting a trust or a company under a trust as the um, uh, the ownership vehicle you can completely eliminate some of those uh, capital taxes um, uh, the other thing that sort of jumps out at me and, it, and it's not as much a risk as it is an opportunity is there's a whack of companies in a whole bunch of different jurisdictions here and um some of them um the the general insurance costs uh 
by the look at the nature of the companies is quite high, the client should probably consider um, forming a captive insurance company or subsidiary um, that's owned by a Canadian company, a holding company even that's owned by the trust um, to capture the underwriting profit on um, insurance premiums that are paid every single year from their operating companies in Mexico, the United States, Great Britain, and, and wherever else. And, and that's such a simple thing to do by creating your own uh, um, captive insurance company and then doing exactly what the insurance companies do, reinsure any catastrophic risk and, and therefore quietly put away 30 or 40 percent of your annual premiums um, into a structure that from from the operating company's perspective, they're going to have the same level of insurance and uh, the same protection, but we're creating a vehicle to enhance family wealth by uh, gradually and conservatively collecting those premiums. Furthermore, it's not stranded capital because um, we can actually move the capital out of the captive insurance company and back up into the holding company as an exempt surplus dividend, particularly when the risks are non-Canadian risk. So those are a couple of the, uh, the more obvious uh, opportunities. There's also some insurance opportunities that, uh, that Jordan may wanna look at around um, the estate free structure and and dealing with any uh, previously built up capital gains tax exposure. Um, and it would seem that an estate freeze now uh, where we would freeze the Canadian companies that would own the foreign companies um, and, and fix the, uh, the death tax liability in Canada, if you will, the deemed disposition, uh, but then uh, cause all of the future growth to occur in the hands of the trust for the benefits of the next generation. In other words, kick out for one complete generation um, or defer the eventual capital gains tax um, from the death of the client, Mr. Diamond himself to at some time uh, in the distant future. Great, I just wanna provide a little bit of clarification because I, I think there's some terms uh, John that uh, John used that I think um, we're uh, perhaps not familiar to everyone. Um, one term that is uh, unique to Canada is a Canadian tax term, exempt surplus. And essentially what it really refers to is the presumption that there's an active business somewhere. In my earlier example, I talked about UAE having an active business. We talked about being able to move funds to Canada without any tax. Well, John's now describing that in the context of a captive insurance company. And we're really talking about a company that is set up for the benefit of this individual and basically would assume a very small, very tiny percentage of the risk. And in effect, uh, what ends up happening is they go to reinsurance market, meaning that the majority of the risk is all covered by, by a reinsurance company. And the interesting thing for those of you in the United States, by the way, it's a very interesting concept because you can put a very wide variety of assets into a life insurance policy. Everything from stocks and bonds to, you know, to ventures to, to uh, say, uh, uh, practically any kind of investment, providing that the insurance company will take it um, that you're working with. And uh, essentially, uh, you could end up with a situation where uh, you're, you can effectively um, earn funds based on what the insurance companies would normally earn from underwriting and other things. Have an active business is not controlled in Canada, but it's controlled elsewhere. On the same basis that we can do this for UAE companies. We had a UAE company, we moved $30 million into Canada without any tax. That was wonderful. Well, there's really nothing stopping us from you know, creating our own active business of, of another sort. Well, insurance is a very interesting way of doing that. I will comment as well that on the InsureCo side, well, we can also issue life insurance shares to either the entrepreneur or directly to the three sons who are located in those three countries. Now, the interesting thing about trust, in, 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 under, if you were talking about Canada, uh, that, well, there's an issue there where if an individual leaves Canada, uh, you may not be a, in a position to consider rolling out, doing a tax-free rollout of a trust to a non-resident. But the remedy for that would be to set up a holding, uh, a company in Canada 
and the individual who, child who lives in Mexico or the UK or wherever he lives, well, he can be the shareholder of that company and you can basically push money out into that corporation uh, or assets out into that corporation. The whole idea is fortification. The whole idea is creating an island. The whole idea is protecting assets. You want to be able to build something that's solid and that contemplates all these different disciplines. So the quantum family office is very much, you know, and, and the consortium is looking to assist, you know, in providing uh, solutions that, you know, are, are not often found, but also integrate various different disciplines and points of view. But uh, you, uh, uh, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna call on um, so David for a moment. Yeah, hey, Brett. Yes, Dr. Yeah. May, may yes, I put put some uh, light in the fire? Please. Okay. Yeah. It's too calm discussion. Uh, you're all experts in law and taxation and the issues surrounding it. And the issue is not only about money. I think it's about continuity. Continuity of life, continuity of business. So I will urge you all the three of you to adopt some of the methods we are using when we are evaluating the, the cyber and building the strategy. And one of them is building a new scenarios. You are all describing scenarios that you used to meet in the past. We were there in cyber. We put antivirus that mitigate the known virus. We put a firewall that mitigate the known attack. But then we realized that we need to go beyond our boundaries. We need to be, to be ahead of the curves. That demands how to think out of the box, building new scenarios, new scenarios, how to protect both on the monetary level and the digital level, excuse me. Fantastic. Uh, your whole idea of an island, uh, uh, Colonel Dorr, is fascinating because in the diagram that you showed previously, you know, not only are we looking to build an island for security, the physical, business intelligence, cybersecurity, but we're also doing that from a point of view of other ways that uh, that a, an individual can be affected. And you're right. We are sometimes too pro preoccupied about losing money. I think that the human value is, is pretty critical. And at the end of the day, being able to sleep at night means a lot. One one of the reasons is that you are not have the look and feel of how a threat look like, and you are not going through an event. You wouldn't realize what could be the impact. So bringing stories from your side about what happened to businesses, what could be the impact, maybe that could be, give the customers the look and feel of what kind of strategy they needed to build to mitigate the new challenges. Yeah, David, what about you? Why don't you chime in on on uh, how to uh, real real life examples of, of, of creating better security from your point of view. Sure, and if we can go back to our uh, family structure with the uh, Mr. Diamond and the uh, and the three sons, um, we're you know uh, I I gave the example of a pandemic as something that uh, was we all thought of as a black swan event, but had a significant impact, and it's you know. It's the un unknown unknowns that what you're doing is giving yourselves optionality of a number of different techniques and abilities to deal with things. We have some knowns. Uh, you know, taxation in Canada, we have to remember that our deputy uh, uh, prime minister, uh, uh, Ms. Freeland, you know, before she uh, became a, 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 an MP, her last book was called Plutocrats. Rise of the super rich and the downfall of the rest. So that gives you a sense of kind of where her mind may be. So taxation is certainly at play in Canada. Uh, in the United Kingdom, it is absolutely at play. Uh, the current prime minister, uh, Mr. Rishi, uh, and his wife um, are taking advantage of something called the remittance tax um, basis, which has been in place since the Napoleonic Wars with uh, Pitt the Elder uh, creating it. Um, but it is a small number of people who it benefits. And when it came out that his wife was taking advantage of this, it handed labor a perfect bumper sticker. It's legal, dot, 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 but is it right? 
and um and, and so we have right now if the tories don't last until the next election which has to be by by the fall of of uh, 2024 um labor will win and labor is vowed to get rid of that remittance tax basis so that's a big problem for our, our son what if uh mr rishi does what a previous tory um prime minister and chancellor of the exchequer did which is david cameron and george osborne and their non-dom scandal of the day was lord ashcroft and they brought in a 15-year limit on that uh so there's a number of things one of the things john uh mentioned and, and a, a trust everybody likes going to the uk and talking about it's it's wonderful non-dom remittance tax basis but it's also the divorce capital of the world and divorce is not a black swan event my wife and i are are maybe solid but i have eight-year-old twins who statistically one of them is going to get divorced and when you're talking about taxation, that's a percentage of income. When you're talking about divorce, that's a percentage of capital. And so you want to protect against that. And so if my, you know, if the eldest son's daughter becomes divorced later on, you know, she would like to be able to go and say to her soon-to-be ex-spouse, you know, I'd love to give you half. It, you know, it's that father of mine who was talking to this guy named mcleod 10 years ago and set everything up in a trust i don't own anything uh so you look at at all those types of things um you know the, the again the optionality uh lots of brits you know as a result of brexit lost access to to europe but again can we get regain that by through the polish citizenship um what if the remittance basis is gone either by labor or Tories doing an own goal. Um, what's the exit plan? Uh, eldest son may not want to come back to Canada. That may be devastating from a tax planning point of view. Uh, a lot of people are moving to the UAE uh, as, a, as another jurisdiction. If we look at the second son in the United States, um, the uh, um, right now there is an ultra-millionaire tax uh, that is talking about taxing 20% of unrealized capital gains, which is pushed by President Biden, which has already passed the House. You had an election yesterday where the uh, um, Democrats won one more seat in Georgia. What if Senator uh, Warnock um, then takes away the whip hand from Senator Manchin? The Democrats get rid of the filibuster. You could have an ultra millionaire tax in the, as early as as next year. Um, the what if you know is he a green card holder? Is he a long term green card holder? When people expatriate from the United States, everybody focuses on the exit tax. Well, there's another stinger in the sale, uh, Section twenty eight hundred one, which is an inheritance tax. So you have to do all the planning. This is where insurance comes in. Uh, are you going to buy properties in the UK? Uh, you know, um, inheritance tax, that's an insurance issue. When we look at son number three, um, he's a Canadian tax resident. There's obviously some personal security issues there. Should he become tax resident in Mexico? Well, the Mexicans elected uh, the former socialist mayor of Mexico City, uh, who goes by the acronym AMLO. A few years ago, he's just elevated a very uh, aggressive uh, former tax minister to be his deputy prime minister. So we've got one in Canada, we've got one in Mexico now. So you want to be careful about that. Um, you want to be able to use you know, tiebreaker rules. You want to be, what if there is a hurricane hitting the Yucatan Peninsula? Um, you need the optionality of multiple documents to be able to travel you need them to be able to move and become non-resident uh in a in today's world mr diamond doesn't necessarily need to be walking the shop floor to oversee all of these things uh so we have a, a world now where we're doing zoom calls with uh between toronto and tel aviv and gadans poland uh and so there's a lot of more risk today, but there's a lot more tools 
and a lot more ability to uh, gain optionality. Well, thank you very much, David. So, Todd, if I have one last final comment. So Please. if you ask me, what should we do? We had 90 minutes. That's what is happening right now at the Mondial, you know, when you're playing. And I say that the game has been changed. So if you want to create your right strategy to protect your assets, so start with defining your critical assets, define the threats, and bring those people here to build your strategy. John McLeod that had been raised on a shore, he couldn't be focused on the monetary issue. David with the hexagon behind his back will bring you the continent issue and you will encapsulate everything with the insurance and I'll bring the digital solution. <laughs> and well said, Ram. I, I'd like to just make a final comment in addition to that. Um, there are many uh, viewers that, that might be thinking to themselves, well, this is for the ultra wealthy, which we can provide for. Uh, and we do so for some of the wealthiest people um, in Canada and elsewhere. But having said that, it doesn't mean that the entire bandwidth has to be used. It might be that a company is more modest. It might be that uh, your situation is equally as real, if that's the case, is your, your situation is equally as important, not only to you, but to us. So at the end of the day, the consortium can provide advice that's tailored and, it, 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 and you might have a car that can drive at you know, 200 miles an hour, but it might be that it's very comfortable to go at a, a more uh, sustainable uh, and pleasurable and effective pace. So the, the reality is, is that um, whether you have a, a, a medium sized company, whether you have a small company, whether you, and everybody has computer systems, companies that have shops, with, with equipment on the floor, you could be shut down. There, we were speaking with someone yesterday that was the victim of having checks authorized and issued from their company account. And again, it's not if, but it's when. And it's what do you do and how do you provide for the tax efficient transfer to the next generation, uh, taking into consideration these points. So we'd like to thank everyone. And we'd like to uh, express our appreciation for all the time you've spent with us. I noticed there's a question and I'll field the question. Uh, it says here, oh, well, thank you. Very nice of the, you to make that comment. We appreciate that. Um, and we feel the same about you. <laughs> uh, I'd like to thank all of our presenters. I'd like to thank uh, Colonel Dorr from Tel Aviv, Israel, um, taking the time at a late hour. Um, what time is it now in Tel Aviv, Colonel Dorr? It is now uh, 8.34 at night, p.m. That, okay, 8.34, David in Poland, that must mean 7.34 for you. Correct. Right, and John, you appear to be in Barbados, but I think that's an illusion. <laughs> <laughs> You're muted, John. <laughs> I'm two hours north of you. Yeah, I was gonna say that. <laughs> Very <laughs> tricky though. Since you, uh, I guess a year ago, that might've been the case that we find you in that surrounding more than today, right? Right. Yeah, so it's nice to get to know uh, the presenters here. It's nice to get to know you. And we look forward to the next session. And thank you very much for staying with us for this time. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. We have one question. Okay. Um, here it's family law cuts through the veil of a trust now. True depends on your jurisdiction, though. So, and John, you may want to comment on, on, for example, if you've got a well-seasoned long-term trust and the ability to uh, uh, protect those assets in a divorce. Yeah, they uh, unfortunately, they or fortunately, I guess the Canadian court can't reach into another jurisdiction and deal with assets. So. Um, but, uh, but it also in the planning, we have to be careful to make sure that any transfer of assets to a trust for the benefit of beneficiaries is not a fraudulent conveyance. And, um, uh, so, uh, one has to be careful, but one can protect assets as long as one does not, uh, those assets aren't the proceeds of crime and, and the transfer isn't a, um, a fraudulent conveyance. And that's an issue we deal with every single day of the week. I'll just add to that, if I may. Um, one of the things that John had mentioned earlier, uh, and I'll just elaborate a little bit further, 
John talked about the statute of Elizabeth and the fact that we have in Canada provincial legislation in every province, and it's referred to as the uh, Fraudulent Conveyances Act. And this kind of legislation is also existing in the U.S. and other places, but there are jurisdictions within the U.S. that have asset protection jurisdictions, such as the state of Wyoming, Nebraska, Alaska, other places. Barbados is a, a place that we sometimes look to set up trust. And I want to play it out, say as an example that there's a, a son or daughter who marries badly and they don't have any money. So what they do is they decide, well, you know, I was promised, uh, you know, ownership in this company. I was promised I'd, I'd be, you know, able to take this business over. Well, all of a sudden, the uh, disillusion of that marriage, if nothing else, is going to change that plan, most likely. And basically, there could be a lawsuit against mother and father because of the fact that the child, the, the spouse doesn't have any money. So, so assuming that there was, and assuming that there was success in, in, um, in court and there was a, an order from one of the courts in Canada, say the province of Ontario, awarding the assets that are held in Barbados, as an example, being trusts of a company here in Canada. Well, what would happen? Well, first of all, there's reciprocal enforcement between Canada and Barbados. The statute of limitations uh, would have it that matter won't be heard if it matter is more than three years old, but assuming that it is, well, the court in Barbados, just like John said, doesn't have the authority to be able to make an award for assets that are not in Barbados. And all we have is really shares of a company from Ontario, Canada. So again, we're anticipating the worst. Uh, I, I guess, Ram, you call it cyberness, uh, sorry, uh, uh, a ready, cyber readiness review. We look at penetration testing. We look at and a simulated attack the same way. What is the very worst thing that could happen? Well, the family courts, just like someone said, I'm not sure who that was, but you're right. The family courts may be able to override a trust. They can break a trust. The courts are reluctant to break a trust, by the way. But we have to be concerned with case law in Canada, Ottawa Weinvolts versus McGuire, where the Supreme Court of Canada rendered a decision that you not only have to be concerned about your existing creditors, but you should also be concerned about your future creditors and the Fraudulent Conveyances Act that might be used, and it's been used a number of times um, in this context, in many times in family law, like you said, um, the, the audience member that said it. And I'm going to say that at the end of the day, it boils down to whether you attempted to hinder, to delay, or defraud a creditor, but that legislation uh, we, we can uh, deal with uh, creating a better island, better security, better outcome. Uh, Todd, um, I'm going to read another question. This will be for you. Do you offer tax and other related planning for clients who have holding companies for investments only in Canada? They are trying to figure out how to liquidate as they approach uh, retirement, taking into account other potential sources of income like pension, OAS, and ensuring maximum amount of funds left over for children. Yeah, I think that's a really good one, John, uh, David. And the answer is there's much that can be done for situations where individuals are looking to seek a, a create a liquidity event. Um, we've been in situations where we've been able to create a liquidity event for, you know, say $50 million of cash that are sitting in a company and been able to achieve the sale of that business and resultant uh, tax that comes out of it um, actually would not apply because of the fact that we've um, been able to um, create an event that wouldn't be taxable in some cases. So the answer is yes, there's things that can be done if there's significant liquidity. Um, in the event that we have a holding company and we want to, and we're earning regular income, a natural consequence of using a trust in a place like Barbados uh, could be Wyoming, could be a lot of other places. Well, that could result in, a, in, in the, the, the capability to reduce the tax by 50%. So instead of paying 50.17% in, in, say, in the province of Ontario or British Columbia or Alberta, well, the tax would be reduced to only 26.5%. And then that can certainly erode someone's a, uh, assets and threaten their security. Uh, capital gains tax can be reduced from 25% to 13 and a quarter percent. 
if you structure things properly. So the answer is we've got lots and lots of solutions and we're really interested in, in creating security for the family and future generations. Now, and the same person has a follow-up or, or continuing the focus of many of her clients is how to plan to have an optimal amount of annual income for say 20 years. And of course, to summarize your answer, let's assume that they've got you know, the source of, of gross income and you are maximizing the net income by reducing as much as possible through this planning, the the drain of taxation on that that gross income. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to say that, you know, when you combine corporate reorganization strategies and create conduits, um, we look at corporate structures as being more like machinery than, than physical structures. And I say that because there is functionality, there's capability to move money from one entity to another, oftentimes with zero tax. And there's also the capability to achieve a tax shelter. Um, in other words, to be able to avoid annual taxation completely. On death, there's a capability to create a capital dividend account, um, just like if you were to sell a capital property, say real estate, well, the death of an individual, that can happen and it can create a massive amount of money that can be taken out for the next generation. So I'd suggest that if you were to combine that with what Jordan described previously, where well, you're essentially leveraging uh, an asset of a corporation and you're uh, borrowing from a bank, and since Jordan explained earlier, bank loans are not taxable, insurance companies uh, are repaid at the time of death. So in other words, what we're really looking to do is to preserve the assets, preserve the integrity of the corporate structure, ensure that in the event of a catastrophic event that we have uh, protections in place. You have a, one final question is, will this uh...